um, I'm, I, how I feel is something that gets manifest over the next uh, hour, let's say, uh, the kind of, uh, of energy, whatever it is that you perceive, you perceive, and you'll make your own evaluation about that. I can tell you that uh, it's time to start another cycle of chemotherapy for the pancreatic cancer with which I live. And uh, it is preceded, it, it, is, it is scheduled for Thursday, but Wednesday there is a CAT scan. When I go every two weeks for chemo, I go early enough to get blood drawn and for them to quickly assay that blood for whatever kinds of markers they can derive meaning. And they, they shuttle those things to the oncologist who then meets with us and goes through and shows shows me uh, and Sabina and whoever else might be with us either on Zoom or, uh, or, or maybe Sibi is on Zoom and somebody else is with me in person. Rabbi Graber has gone a couple of times giving us a, uh, five hours, four or five hours together to learn. And it's been extraordinary. Reading poetry in the Duke infusion rooms is not something, Hebrew poetry is perhaps not something with which they are so familiar, but, uh, but, but we have done it. Uh, in any event, um, Wednesday will be the CAT scan. Thursday, they will tell me the results or tell us the results of the CAT scan and what they plan to do going forward in terms of medication. If things go the way they're imagining that they're going to go, they will be ready to be, you'll correct me if I'm, incorrect, if I'm wrong about it, but they will be ready to drop one of the infusions that I get and that will uh, eliminate certain kinds of side effects. And I get the sense that it doesn't really shorten the time that I'm there. And I don't remember exactly why, uh, what they replace it with or what they do. But, but in any event, the time is not a real factor. The time is delightful time. Uh, I get to read, I get to study poetry or Talmud, or I get to talk to Sabina, or we get to listen to music, or I get to write in a journal and uh, there's nothing uh, unpleasant about the chemotherapy. I've even participated in some lovely events at the Hartman Institute during their online rabbinic seminars this summer. Uh, some events that were actually done in my honor by one of my favorite teachers. So You also got to teach your grandson for his bar mitzvah in February or in March. You got to have a couple sessions with him while you were right. sitting in the chair. While I was while I was sitting in that uh, sitting, yeah, so, yeah, uh, reaching across the world and from a place that has good internet, and <laughs> uh, I have been uh, a lucky soul in that I uh, tolerate. I seem to be tolerating the effects of uh, chemotherapy in a really good way. So, but you'll be a, you'll be a better judge of that. And uh, part of the uh, part of the good effect, I think, is the uh, the healing or making whole. Does the word heal and whole and health come from the same the same word, at least in English? I wish it were so in Hebrew. It's not. But healing and holing and healthing uh, are all part of the same uh, conglomerate of words in English. And community that is healthy um, makes its individuals in some ways or stimulates health within, within its individuals. And thinking about y'all and thinking about coming on and reading some poetry or exploring and exploring a theme um, gives me a, a certain amount of energy more than caffeine or, or anything else. So end of good and welfare report. I'm actually trying along the way to write some things about this so that people can see it more um, than, they, than they do right now. Let me see. Um, I see Peter and Marilyn there. Wow, it feels like romper room. Hello, Peter and Marilyn. I see you through my <laughs> magic mirror. <laughs> uh, and I have received from them in recent days some really interesting photographs and some very um, compelling stories and about, about doors and about memorials and doors. And we think about it through... Um, again, each of these is freestanding, but 
all the resources are available and it, it would be unfair to say that there's no cumulative effect that comes or no cumulative understanding that comes. So when we read about the doorway and we read about the way in which we condense the power of the doorway and put a mezuzah on the door and we, we read what the Rambam has to say, what Maimonides has to say about the mezuzah reminding us of oneness, the oneness in the universe and that we should set aside the travel, the travails of, uh, uh, of, of the day and focus on, uh, on that which brings us together in mind, certain mindfulness and certain love. We wonder whether or not, or I wonder whether that's the only symbol. It's the one that the Bible mentions, but Peter and Marilyn um, introduced us to, or introduced me anyway, to another kind of symbol. And, and I, I wish you would unmute yourself and selves and say something about that for people who might not have heard. Um, my father was born in Leipzig, Germany. And um, we were able a bunch of years ago to be traveling in Europe and I decided that I wanted to go to Leipzig. I knew the address of his apartment that he grew up in. And so um, with the help of Google Maps, we actually found it. And um, we parked the car and we went over to these beautiful doors to the apartment complex. It was like, a, not a complex, it's just a block of flats. And while we were there, um, the door opened and uh, a couple and their daughter came out with their bikes. And um, it turns out they, were, they wanted to know why we were standing in front of the door. Um, I told them that this was the block of flats that my father had grown up in and told a little of the story. He, he um, my grandparents were the last to leave. My father was next to the baby and so his brothers were already gone. My grandparents still lived in the building um, and uh, my father was also gone and he was in the States. My grandparents left in 38, 38, in 38 to, London. to London where the other part of the family was. My father and another brother were here. And these people were very taken with the story of us being there. Um, let us go inside the building, which had been renovated on the outside um, from damage during the war. And we could actually see the neighboring building was still kind of a mess on the outside. We pointed out the staircase, which was this big wooden staircase coming, a circular staircase with all these well-worn steps on it. And I had stories of my father running down those steps to go to a park across the street. Um, they kept the original tile on the floor and they kept a, um, they had redone the walls in the hallway, but kept one original fleur de lis from the original design. So that was incredibly moving. And then this couple pointed to us, pointed out to us, which we didn't particularly notice that at the outside of the door, were three yeah, come. stepping stones. We're called stepping stones, tripping, tripping stones. stones. And there on them were engraved the names of the people who had lived in that block of flats mm -hmm. who were deported from that building. And of course, looking at them reminded me how fortunate I was that my grandparents left but knowing then that those people were no doubt the neighbors that my grandparents had lived with. And um, so that whole doorway experience just was um, overwhelmingly emotional, not to, mention, um, not to mention then learning about these. And in fact, we now have also learned that they are all over Berlin as well. It turns out that it was started by a, a, a German artist and they are in Leipzig and Berlin and represented around the country as sort of a national memorial to individuals, not famous individuals, but ordinary individuals who uh, lived there and got caught up in, uh, uh, in, this, in the horror of the Holocaust. And uh, they, would, they had the information down to for each 
for each of these stones, they, uh, as they call it, they had the, the name, the date at which they were deported, and then the date that they, they died, died and the location uh, that they died. Incredibly moving, uh, both at the individual level, uh, but at the, the broad collective level. It's very powerful, it's very moving. And with your permission, we will, as soon as we actually get to it, uh, we will post the, uh, the pictures that you've sent. Yeah. And I would like to, um, I found some articles from uh, The Guardian and from other uh, European papers that talk about these tripping stones or stumbling stones, or stumbling stones. various translations. I don't remember the original, I don't remember the German of it. Uh, um, along with some pictures of the artist and something about how it is that these things are set so that they can't be removed. Right. Or can't be, uh, can't be stealing them and so on. And thinking about having something that marks the threshold that was the final chosen threshold of these independent citizens. That is to say, they chose to live there, but they didn't choose to leave there. Right. right. Mm. Uh, that there's something extraordinarily compelling and powerful about that. Uh, as I read through one of the articles, I found that there's an interesting sort of, uh, I'll just call it a machloket to draw it into the Jewish um, world for a minute. Machloket, a term that we probably many know, but don't, uh, know, don't know the exact meaning of it. It means an argument. Uh, it comes from the word chelek. Lechalek means to, uh, to apportion something. A chelek here and a chelek there. And a machloket doesn't have to have two sides to it. It, ha it has pieces to it. It can have a lot of pieces to it. But uh, the traditional machloket is between, you know, Hillel and Shammai or something like that, right? Rabbi Meil and Rabbi Akiva. A machloket, I want to say, uh, that exists in Germany today about whether this is uh, a memorial strategy that actually does honor to the deceased or whether it's something that trivializes and literally st stomps on people's names. And there are serious contenders on both sides in that, in that machloket, of both pieces of that machloket. And I started to think about this in terms of Rabbi Eliezer HaKapar, the, the teacher who I, I claim to you animates himself and makes himself like the doorway or imagines the teacher like the doorway who says, no, be a threshold, be a threshold. And people will walk over it, but that's the legacy that everybody will be, um, everybody will be, will be able to, to make this transit and have an opportunity to remember and glance down. So extending this, this is what I, I, I love to do and I think is so useful for us to, to extend the sicha, to extend the conversation uh, in all of these ways and the, all of these voices become part of one conversation that is, uh, it's not exclusively a Jewish conversation, but uh, it informs Jewish conversations and, and, and makes its way into that world. So uh, we'll, post, um, we'll post a lot of that material in uh, hopefully in the week that comes. Um, anything else that, uh, Thanks, Phyllis. What was this? Can you can you say the the name the name of this for us? Yeah, I I got it. It's a, oh. a Stolperstein. Stolperstein. Right, and it means steadily st stumbling stone or stone. Yeah, that you, yeah that's the original. Yeah. that's the original yeah. German. Yeah, yeah, and I because they are they're meant not to make you physically stumble. It's not it's not Rabbi Elazar Hakapar's larger, higher threshold of which you have to be careful because you'll stomp your toe on it and slip and scrape your arm up like I did the other day. Um, or um, it's not that, it's not that. But, the, but you might look down on it and, and, you, and you might see it, especially because of the, the pictures that I've seen. They're, they're a burnished kind of bronze, gold, bronze color and you can't help but look down at them and see them. And right there at the at the doorway, uh, that kind of mindfulness brings me back to Elazar Kapar for the threshold. It brings me to the Rambam for what it means to 
to think about unity, what it means to think about love, what it means to, to think about stripping away all of the um, uh, the elements of, uh, the, of, of, of time uh, so that you're standing in the presence of the presence. Uh, those are uh, those are, are powerful and important sentiments and all of them visible and available for us at the door. So having done having said that, yeah, may I just ask because I was wondering about I mean, if it's not a stumble to stumble. So it's so it's like stumbling on something you didn't know was there, like, um, you know, I mean, yeah, the writing right, that's right, on right. that location. Uh, yeah. So it's stumbling on it as something an, an unknown to you is what it means. Okay. I think so. I think so. I just stumbled across this. Look at this lovely, lovely book that I found. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I think it's that. The, the, the couple that, the family that uh, emerged from the apartment building uh, after they called it, uh, these stones to our attention were of the belief that they were to be set there uh, at the at the threshold so as to guarantee that you would see them uh, each time you went in so that you were conscious of of who had lived there and who had been uh, been lost and uh, uh, they, that was the side of the argument uh, that they were familiar with mm -hmm. and this was a the, the guy in this family was the, they were Dutch. Uh, he was the director of the international school in Leipzig, as it turns out. And he said, that's the way they basically teach it when they are uh, doing a Holocaust Memorial Day in their school, uh, Remembrance Day in their school. And in a very touching way, he added that uh, in an email uh, exchange that uh, uh, whenever he, uh, presides over one of these ceremonies again in the uh, in the future in his school. He will remember Marilyn's father and grandparents and bring them into the conversation. Yeah, uh, he said it. He said it added a whole other, um, a whole other um, emotional and intellectual aspect to his teaching of the Holocaust. Actually, having met <clears throat> us, and it brought it it brought it home to him. In a, in a totally different kind of way, which he was sure he could um, tell and um, influence his students. So that was, a, that was kind of another plus to the entire situation. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, a, that's extraordinary. Um, many of us have had similar kinds of experiences. Sidi and Eddie and Stacy, along with another couple of friends, were in Spain a couple of summers ago and, and in Toledo, we uh, we witnessed the, uh, the the doors, the medieval doors that had uh, keyholes in them that had been reset or fake keyholes put in. Do you remember? So that uh, anybody coming back who owned the original key to that building, these are places from which Jews had been evicted. Jews had lost their property. If you came back with the key and you could open the door, that was a serious legal claim on the property. And people had those holes barred up and new keyholes, fake keyholes put in that could not be opened. And, and in many, in almost every museum that uh, told that part of the story, we saw keys that had come back home, even though they no longer had locks within which they would fit. So um, we can post some of those stories. Mm -hmm. Oh, you have, you have such a key, Stacey. Where, what, where did that key? That's a facsimile of a, you're, you're muted. <laughs> okay, anyway, it's a key. That is the key. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the other story that comes to mind is a story that I'm going to solicit really from uh, from Yaakov um, Ariel's brother, David. He tells a story about an Arab Pesach when an Arab family knocked on their door uh, in Abu Tur, a, a wonderful neighborhood that used to house or that still houses both Arab and Israeli residents. 
uh, this neighbor knocked on the, this person whom they did not know knocked on the door and said, this is a house, can we see the house? This is a house where we grew up. And they had a conversation at the door, Yaakov's father with, um, with this Arab uh, and his family, this Arab citizen of Israel with his family. And David, little David, as he told the story to me one time, he said, I, I wondered, you know, if this is their house, why don't we give it to them? And the answer was a kind of complicated, but a sad one about why we don't give it to them. And it's an extraordinary story. They did invite them to come in. And I think they invited them to the Pesach Seder, as a matter of fact. But uh, uh, I'd love for David, in his own words, to tell you that story. So we get another chance to telescope that kind of story with this kind of 20th century meaning, with Elazar HaKapar, with all of these poets and poems, with the halachic value of what it means to be inside or outside at the door and in the doorway, what it means to be in between in the space that is neither here nor there, what it means to claim or be claimed by a space where in and out are hinged together. Uh, the Torah of the door is mighty indeed. So more stories to be told and more, uh, more more things, more projects to be shared. There's also projects and other stumbling stone story projects. There's no reason why we can't do something like that as well. Uh, and maybe it doesn't have anything to do with members of the Jewish community reflected in the consciousness of the, uh, the, the non-Jewish uh, government that's trying to figure out how to do the right thing at this point. Maybe it has to do with Black Lives Matter, or maybe it has to do with some other state of consciousness that you would like to, uh, to attain when you walk into or out of your house that doesn't detract or take anything away from the presence of the mezuzah. You can still have a mezuzah. Doesn't mean that your mezuzah has to be painted in the colors of this political platform or that. It can still be the one that you bought in Sfat, you know, or in the gift shop at the synagogue. It doesn't make a difference. But maybe there's another kind of project to inform us of something else in the doorway that we can learn from somebody else, maybe somebody that we never imagined learning such a Torah from. But now here we are in a world where we're learning it. Okay, finally, 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 um, Jewish theology, God who is like a door. Oh, General Highland started screen sharing. That looks good, thanks. Just take a look at the Hebrew, lick it, Lick your screen, get a taste of it, because we're not gonna we're not gonna read it unless there are particular words that are interesting to you. But it always, always, always seems like the right thing to me to have the Hebrew there for reference and for the appearance of it. And so we shouldn't get tired of looking at it or have it seem strange to us. But if we could enlarge it, Jenna, so that we get to see the English, or yeah, just the English privilege the English over the Hebrew for purposes of everybody reading and everybody understanding. We're just, I think we fell off the edge just a little bit. Good. All right. Great. Thank you. Jewish theology. Theo, Theo. In my youth, I knew a boy whose name was Theodore, like Herzl, but his mother called him Theo. Theo, come home from the playground. Theo, don't hang around with the bad kids. Theo, Theo, yeah, yeah, yeah. First stanza. <laughs> what do you think? What gets your interest? I don't see everybody now. I think I might be able to figure it out, but um, I see more people now. But if you still don't know, if you've raised your hand and Hawkeye Jenna is looking at it, she'll recognize you or somebody will. What do you think? What's going on there? Kind of playfulness? Yeah, what do you think, Carol? Uh, it reminds me of uh, when I was growing up in the Bronx. You know, everybody who lived in the apartments were all European born. But this was in the 50, 40s and 50s. There was one family, the mother used to lean out the window all the time, calling at her sons. Bummy, bummy. And he kept saying, my mom, my name is Albert. Call me Albert. Bummy, <laughs> bummy, do this. Don't, you, don't do that. Bummy? Bummy. Where'd that come from? 
Pay as Mia. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Somebody who had some kind of a, a, a European language-based nickname that didn't want to be called by that, wanted to be called by his American name. Yeah, I see uh, another iPhone hand. It's Stephanie, yes? Um, just what jumped out at me was the, the root, theology and Theo. And I don't know what to make of it, but it just jumped out at me, the name Theo and then the theology's word. Yeah, how about that? How about that? Well, as you can imagine, they do come from the same root. They are the same word. Theos, theos is a Greek word for God. Uh, theologos is that science of or that structure of knowing about God. Theodoros, uh, in Hebrew, the word doros has become doron, uh, the name doron, which is, I think, the accusative uh, form of, of doros in Greek. Uh, that is to say, gift. Theodoros means a gift from God. And doron, uh, the Hebrew name Doron means a gift. Know anybody named Doron? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's where the name comes from. It's a, it's a actually yeah. it's a Greek name. So yeah, that's kind of interesting. Let me just explore. Uh, the playful poet says, "Let me just explore this word theology. What the hell is that? You know, the uh, it's it, it's the clearly the theme and the title of the poem." Jewish theology, what can I say? What can I adduce? What do I know about theology? Well, um, I know the Theo part of it because I know this guy whose name is Theo, Theo, or his real name was Theodore, by the way, like Herzl. So he's got his own kind of, let's not say mythology, but his own kind of hero structure, his own kind of hero worship structure. Uh, there is a, there's a Theodore in the world. I assume my friend of my childhood was, was named Theodore, like Herzl, but his mother called him Theo. Theo, come home from the playground. Theo, Theo, don't hang around with those bad kids. The bad kids. And then comes the poet, probably, it just doesn't sound like the poet's mother, like, uh, uh, like Errol's neighbor uh, hanging out the window saying, Theo, Theo, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound right. That sounds like the poet. <laughs> but what he's, what he seems to be doing there is deconstructing the word. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's, de he's just taking it apart. Theo, Theo, and making it into a cheer or a Beatles song or something. You know, I don't know what he's doing with it. Uh, Theo, Theo, log, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, know he's, I don't know exactly what he's doing with it, but at a, at a time when we can, we can go back and look at the Hebrew, you'll, you'll see something that's kind of interesting. Um, Jenna, you want to make that happen for just a second? No, the other way. Yeah. Uh-huh, and you look at the word, uh, the last line of the stanza, you see it, teo, if you look, he, teo, teo, first stanza, last line of the stanza, teo, teo, log, ya, 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 do you see it, ya, 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 what you know from that is that because of that dot in the hay, you see, ya, 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 and the hay, each hay has a dot in it. What that means is that the poet is talking about Adonai. That's the way you abbreviate if you look in the Psalms and you find the word hallelujah, wherever you see it, you'll see a dot like that in the last letter of hallelujah. It means we're not just saying yay at a football game. It's not that. If it has a hay with a dot, it's God. So what the poet is doing here is breaking down the word and playing with it in his characteristic Amichai um, devilish way uh, and 
whatever he does with the word log, I don't know. Log has some meaning, but I don't think that's relative, relevant here. I think, uh, I think what's relevant here is teo, teo, and ya, ya, ya. They mean the same thing. They mean the same thing. So he's taking this word theology and he's making it, he's recognizing that it's not a Jewish word. Do we even have a concept of theology? I think, yeah, was there a hand that I almost saw? Yes, Adina. You're muted. Yeah, yeah. I think what he also does, which is also one of his devilish things to do, is that he takes a very lofty concept like theology that some people may be a little bit afraid of using or, or a little bit intimidated by that. And he makes it into a ch child's game and he makes it into something fun and it makes it more accessible because Teo and Ya yeah, and Teo, Teo, Log, Ya, Ya, Ya becomes a rhyme, becomes a game and becomes much more accessible and something that anyone can play with. Yeah, can play with and and uh, dissect and, and separate into its pieces. <laughs> and yeah. and, and, uh, and it, it becomes much more available. It becomes much more available and playing with the possibility of meaning. I hate to, uh, I hate to pick on, um, on Marilyn Ornstein um, and Stacy because um, there are other great teachers out there, but just think about the extraordinary moments when students start to play, young students start to play in ways that are going to imagine them towards learning. A new word, a new concept, a new way of behaving, a new uh, skill or something. And it begins with just absolute unmitigated play and then becomes a, uh, becomes a skill that's adaptable for something else. And uh, I know that you uh, you all glory in those in those extraordinary moments. Uh, it's something that yes. Yeah, they also in early childhood, uh, the repet repetitiveness of sounds uh, also um, um, reinfor it reinforces the child's pronunciation. It re reinforces the child's understanding. It brings it to a, a different a different depth, and this. You know the, this whole first paragraph, it, as Adina was saying, is it's it's a it's a fun for a young child. It's a fun um, thing to say. It's a, there's it's it has it has a it resonates for a young child and it would it could stay with them. It's almost like a chant, right? Right. And young children love chants, and they play to chants, and they. They bounce balls to chance and they jump rope to chance. Mm. And that I agree with you that repetitive sound patterns, even babies love sound patterns. That's the first start of the talking, and they'll just repeat it over and over again. So there's something, there's something about us that's a, human beings that's appealing to that chanting, repetitive sounds of words. Yeah, here's another door story that we might get to at some point along the way, that a child in utero um, has a kind of analog. That is to say, the baby is gestating the way the physical baby is gestating. But in the vaults of the heavens, perhaps just below its mother's heart, perhaps out in outer space somewhere, there is an angel who is leading that child all through the vaults of heaven and showing that child everything that will unfold, all things. Then the teacher says, or the, the narrator says, but wait a minute, wouldn't that make the child a prophet? And only prophets are prophets. Everybody else is a non-prophet, you know? Uh, but the child, uh, sorry, uh, not every child is, is a prophet. Uh, and the response is that at the door of the womb, at the, at the door, where the child is going to depart that heavenly world, an angel smacks it on the lips, smacks the child on the lips, and the child forgets all of the Torah that she has learned in the vaults of the heavens, 
and then is ex exits that door and comes into the world and then begins to learn and reclaim the Torah that once was known but now is lost. And that life becomes the project on the other side of the door to reclaim the Torah that once was known and maybe in some ways is still deeply known but only manifests itself in those moments which you might call deja vu or uh, some other phenomenon that just where you're prescient about something and you just know that something is true or something is going to happen. Anyway, the door continues to be uh, a presence uh, and all kinds of doors. Right now, we're gonna go back to the house, not that houses the uterus, but that houses our, our, uh, our guy, our poem, poet, um, and uh, just like the house that houses his friend Theo, and let's go back to the English, if we can, Jenna. Yeah. So there's the first, uh, the first stanza. Um, hold on. Yes. Jewish theology. Jewish. What the is Jewish about it? Theology. What's Jewish about it? Theo. Theo. Well, in my youth, I knew a boy whose name was Theodore, like Herzl. He was Jewish. But his mother called him Theo. Theo, come home from the playground. Theo, don't hang around with bad kids. Theo, Theo, Logue, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want a God who is seen, but does not see. Whom I can lead around in order to tell him about that which he does not see. I want a God who is seen, and who sees, I want to see how he covers his eyes like a child playing blind. I want a God, talking about theology and Yah, God, I want a God who is seen but does not see, whom I can lead around in order to tell him about that which he does not see. And I want a God who is seen and who sees. I want it both ways. I want to see how he covers his eyes like a child playing blind. I want a God like a window that if I open it, I will see the heavens while myself staying in the house. I want a God who is like a door that opens only outward. But God is like a door that swings on its hinge in and out and continues to swing through its arc without beginning, without end. Beli reshit, beli acharit. All right. This guy seems to want to have it both ways in stanza two. I read it better the second time. <laughs> I want a God who is seen but does not see, whom I can lead around in order to tell him about that which he does not see. And I want a God also who is seen and who sees. I want to see how he covers his eyes like a child playing blind. What kind of attitude or for you Philadelphians, what kind of attitude do you uh, do you see in those? Well, I, uh, yeah, yeah, why knows it's anything except the traditional idea of God who is all seeing but is not seen. The one who sees but is not seen. The rabbinic uh, locution that, that means God, the one who sees but is not seen. So he's playing with that. On the last line, it seems that he wants to observe God performing Tsim Tsum, limiting God's very self by, by inhibiting his own sight. Uh, wouldn't that be wonderful to be able to observe Tsim Tsum by God? Tsim Tsum being that mystical concept of God 
contracting without losing any kind of, of, of material weight or, va or valence, uh, but just occupying a smaller space. And, and so, making space for, for others. Mm -hmm. From yeah. filling the universe to filling the Holy of Holies, let's say, yeah. is one act that we might think about regarding Yom Kippur. So, yeah. But I I'll think it's, it's about the relationship between God and, and this, the poet, at least, and the human beings, about who sees and what is being seen. It's all about seeing in relation to what is not being seen and who does it. And the, even the, the game that he, in, that he invents, that he wants to lead God that pretends not to see, that is playing to be blind. And it's all about seeing and not seeing in relation to each other. Yeah. Um, and one of the thoughts I had mm. is a, one of the concepts that is, have evolved in Israel, a, describing is Jews, Israeli Jews, but Jews who are not necessarily halachic Jews, a, or, and they don't want to call themselves chiloni, which is a secular. And the new concept that has evolved is Yehudi Chaloni. A, a Jew that sees that sees the world through a window that does not have shutters, and that is a, it can be a halachic Jew or a non halachic Jew, but it's a it's a Jew that looks at the world without shutters through windows, and it that that image has is evoked here by by this poem, which is That's I want I want I want the window and I want to see, and sometimes I don't want to see, but I want to see through the window. That's lovely. I've never heard that before. I'm in your debt, yeah. and I hope if you have a, a link to something written about that, or, or you've written something. I do. I do a lot. I do. I, I will send you. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, it's instead of instead of chiloni, which comes from a word that means every day, let's say it means a lot of things, but it means every day. Chiloni, secular. Uh, chaloni, which comes from a different root, very close, but su subtly, subtly related, but not the same. And the chalon is a window. So I want a God who sees, but does not see. Okay, that's the second, uh, second stanza. I want a God like a window. I want a God like a window. Such that if I open it, in the third exactly. Now he wants something very specific. This guy is very, he knows what he wants. He wants to be, and maybe it was subtly different from what Adina, or not so subtly different from what Adina was suggesting. He doesn't want to implicate himself so much. He doesn't want to go outside. There's something very nice about seeing it through the window. He's happy enough. The poet's happy enough seeing it through the window. And, and if that doesn't come through so strong, perhaps the next line helps. I want a God like, like a door. It only opens outward. Exactly. I have to pull it inward. Sabina, don't make me have to go to the front door to see whether our front door opens outward or inward because I'm... <laughs> But you know, no, it, it opens outward, right? No, it opens in. Oh, shoot. Okay. <laughs> all house doors <laughs> open inward. What? Uh, all house doors open inward because it's a, they're all welcoming. And also in case of an avalanche, you're not barricaded in your house. Like if there's something against it, you can always open it and it falls in the home. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't know that. Thank I you. think he's continuing to be. Of course, yeah, go ahead. I'll share my image in a minute. Go ahead, Sibi. Sibi. I, I think he's continuing to be playful in this. He started being playful in the first, in the first stanza. And you can almost picture him um, kind of standing outside being the child whose mother is, like Errol was saying, calling from the window. And he wants to sort of pretend that he can hear his mother, but he doesn't want to hear his mother. Um, 
he wants to be seen. He doesn't want to be seen. He wants her to see him, but not see him. The whole thing with the window and the authority um, and, the, and the playfulness, it just all, you know, it all comes together. I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but I just see all these pieces in it. Um, and, and I think he's struggling um, with large concepts um, as Amichai tends to do and, and brings them down to reality of theology being, you know, okay, let's call it a game and let's call God, you know, something that we can identify with a, a window or a door that we can go in and out and kind of be there when, when we need to have God and not be there when sort of close the door or close the window when we don't want, want God to, to be part of uh, or see what we're, what we're involved in. So I just feel like this playfulness just goes through the whole poem. Yes, playfulness, sarcasm, and a certain kind of, um, uh, of anti, uh, of, of anti-traditional traditionalist sentiment, let's say. Uh, I want a God, but I don't think he does very much. And I don't want to be totally implicated in what he does. It, it, it almost sounds as if he's creating his own God. I will set the boundaries of what God is, who God is, and what God can and cannot do. Right, right. And he wants to do it from within the bounds of his own home. He, mm. doesn't, he doesn't want to go outside. And he can do it. Uh, in this poem, he can do it because the, the house is a world where you can pretty much frame things in the way you want to. He wants, Theo, Theo, come home from the playground. Theo, don't hang around with the bad kids. He wants, uh, let me say it this way, he wants to domesticate God. Mm. He wants to domesticate him, which is to say, to bring him to the domicile. He wants him to be housebroken. He wants a God who's going to perform the way he wants his God to perform. Mm. He's got some very sarcastic and bitter notions. I want a God who is seen but does not see. I get that's a traditional notion. But I want a God who's, who, can, who is seen but does not see, whom I can um, mm. around in order to tell him about that which he does not see. I want to be able to call his attention to all the stuff that's going on in the world that God clearly doesn't see. Because if God saw it, it wouldn't be going on in the world. So, oh, the God who sees but does not see, it's not really so, it's more of an indictment than it is a praise. God who sees but does not see, more an indictment than an acclamation. And at the same time, I want a God who is seen and who, and who also sees because I want to see how he covers his eyes in order to ignore the stuff hmm. that he should be tending to, but he's not. He doesn't like these non undomesticated, non domesticated uh, um, issues regarding God. He's not comfortable with them. Theology is supposed to be something that is exact. I'm always, I myself am always suspicious of it. I'm as suspicious of it as I am with meteorology. <laughs> Let's say meteorology and theology are both ologies that will tell you exactly what happened yesterday and create, <laughs> a, and create a model that is 100% <laughs> right that fits why it happened yesterday. Now, yesterday they got the prediction wrong. But the day after, they can certainly get it right. There are probably other ologies like that too, maybe even an osophy or two. But uh, uh, but certainly, the uh, there, there are those two ologies that uh, come together. You really think you can domesticate God? You think you can predict stuff? You can say God is great, God is good, and we thank Him for our, our food. That's kind of, that's as much of a, a, of a little mantra as Theo, Theo, la, ya, ya, ya. You think that's right? In a world of COVID and a collapsing economy where people don't have food to eat, who've learned to say that uh, rhyme in their house. And I wonder whether they're still saying that kind of rhyme in their house and maintaining it or whether it has collapsed. 
um, along with many other things. I, I certainly challenges his a traditional notion of what theology is, and he is anything but a traditionalist when it comes to theology. And he wants a God who is kimo chalon, who want, he wants a God who's like a window in the house, but he himself wants to stay in the house. Uh, and he wants a God who is like a door, but the door opens only outward, which means, and I said, started to say before, interject, uh, of course the, in the, the house door opens inside. I'm remembering now when I was a child and my brother Barry one year went to the front door uh, to open the screen door for Eliyahu Hanavi on the night of Pesach. And uh, it was an early Pesach, um, or rather it was a late Pesach, and the screen was, my father had already put the screen door on. You should spent the winter in the basement because no sense having a screen door on during the middle of the winter. It did no good. It was just something else to open. But during the spring, we didn't have an air-conditioned house, so it was, uh, uh, it, it was important to us to have the screen door that could be opened along with the window in the straight through kitchen area. So I remember Barry going to the door and opening the, the real door behind him, opening it into the house, of course, and taking the very light screen door and pushing it out with his hands and standing right in the middle of the opening. And my father, before we started to sing, my father said, well, get out of his way. <laughs> something that I'll, I'll always remember it's a small little thing but it was the only time that I remember my father actually entering into what I would call the mythology the religious imagination of Pesach of course Eliyahu was coming for the door <laughs> and I was coming through the door and of course he needed a place to come through because he was, after all, accorded, uh, uh, dignif accorded the dignity of that space that a human being needs. Don't stand in the middle and block the door. But the image comes to me not because of Elijah, although we know, we might know from other studies, and we'll know something again here, that Elijah is the guardian of the doors and the guardian of thresholds. But for now, just back to the door, and then a few lines as a kind of an epilogue for us before we close. Even though I want a God who is a, like a door who opens only outward, I'm not getting it because God is like a door that swivels on a hinge. That's a little hint of Ecclesiastes there. God is like a door who swivels on a hinge. I forget, in some of the first chapter of Ecclesiastes, the wind coming and going and swiveling around, and it'll knock you flat. God will knock you flat. So be careful. You think that you want a God whom you can control how God is going to open uh, and close? Well, that's not the reality of it, folks. The reality of it is that God continues to... Uh, to swing around like a swinging door and it has no beginning and no end, which sounds a little bit liturgical to us. Why doesn't he say Tachlit here? I don't know. I don't know why he doesn't say it. I think he might just be hoping that we'll salivate over it. <laughs> hoping that we'll, we'll, you know, we'll be thinking it, but he doesn't want to use that traditional uh, uh, ending for uh, Adon Olam. So um, the God who is domesticated or theology that we like to think we can domesticate theology, but no, because while well, God is a door, God is, is not a door who, uh, or like a door, God is not like a door that you can control all the time and just open the way that you want to, only out. In fact, um, as I've been retaught, front doors open only in. And that's a problem. And it was certainly the case in um, medieval times that, that we, we know of. And, and ancient times, the door was on a hinge. It could open either way. But mainly, you see doors that are open to the inside. Um, you're right that I can think of in Katrin and other places. So you can't domesticate God. God is indeed 
like a door. Um, but now to another fragment from the family album. God's Door into the World, the other poem, the other tiny piece of a poem. It's not a whole poem, but a tiny piece of a poem uh, to just call to your attention and maybe you have a one or two things to say about it before we finish. Um, do you have it? Um, Jenna, do you have that other piece? Yeah, close, 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 close. Oh, that, that picture is really nice too. It's a keyhole. Yeah. yeah, a keyhole. It's a keyhole with the promise of steps behind it. You know, do you see that? Mm -hmm. Keyhole with steps behind it. Ooh. Yeah. And I can tell you, uh, I should be able to tell you, but I apparently don't have the whole set of information here in this little booklet. But this was, uh, this is a work by one of the artists who created the Mosaic Art Studio, which is a project of lifespan in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's an organization that empowers children and adults with disabilities by providing education, employment, and enrichment opportunities to their lives and to their work and to their play in community. The art studio is directed by a woman named Holly Lamke, who's 29 years old, now 30, who received her BFA in 2010 from uh, Kazenovia College. I don't know where that is. So uh, this is done by a person who is uh, developmentally disabled hmm. and who responded to a request that I made from their organization to have people follow this theme once upon a time and create artwork that gave uh, that would give us some um, give us some doors and ways of thinking about doors and openings. Uh, and this artist to be named later because there's another sheet that I don't have in front of me that I think I can get, uh, and by then I'll know. But um, showing us some interior space that seems important to the artist who did not see the poem. The poem is. Uh, the, just, just the theme was shared, not the text. You can see the last lines of, a, of, a, of an Amichai poem um, talking about us in our woundedness. Through the wound in my chest, God peeks into the world. Aval derech apetza bichazi metzitz Elohim latevel. Ani hadelet bidirato. I am the doorway. I am the door in God's opening. Mm -hmm. In his dwelling. Yeah. In his dwelling. I am the door in his dwelling. Yes, of his dwelling. What do you think? Wow. Nice choice. Choice, choice. <laughs> Out is, it's a poem that's, of course, cut apart from the other poem altogether. Well, it takes a concept. It just, it shifts my perspective completely because you tend to think if someone is looking through a wound in your chest, they're looking into inside of you. But when God looks through our woundedness, God sees not just not inside of us. He's already on the inside, but looking out. And uh, that's not where I usually think of locating God. Where do you think the poet is locating God in this? Again? God yeah. is on the inside. Inside of you? Inside of me, but through my right. wounded, through my wound. So the wound in the poet's chest, then God is looking out from inside of the poet. Lovely, yeah. So, okay. go ahead. Did you say that the that the person who did this painting was did not know the poem? Right. So that what strikes me when I look at this in that it's as if a keyhole 
was painted in which to look through. So I find that quite remarkable because to me, that painting goes beautifully with peeking into a world through a keyhole and that world would be um, the person who has the wound. Thank you. We chose that picture to put on that page. We had, we had what, six pictures, Steve? Or more. Yeah. Yeah, we had a number of them, and that was the one. I Because, thank you. I think it does go nicely with that. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. It definitely. And, and there are even, to me, looks like some steps that if you can't quite see in, if you got up the steps, you'd be able to peek inside to really get to the essence of, mm -hmm. of the issue. It's pretty yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty intriguing. It's pretty inviting. Uh, what, how about a step farther, a step farther, a step farther? What can you see from where you are? What's that world that is beyond? Can you get there from here? Big stories that we ask about uh, various parts of our lives in general, from everyday things to matters much more ethereal and last and lasting uh, in our lives. And hence the, the value of the entire theme, especially one that uh, is such a, a dense theme and, and, and articulated in so many different ways. In religious imagination, you see a poem that has to do a great deal with religious imagination. Uh, God peeks into the world. Uh, through the wound in my chest, God peeks, in, God peeks into the world. I am the door of his dwelling. <laughs> Can, can I say something about keyholes? Yeah, please. I I once did a whole series of keyholes, and and one of the things that really intrigued me is when you look through a keyhole, you don't get the whole picture. You just get a part of what of what's outside and what's possible, and it was really all what's inside. It was really always a very intriguing. Thought. It is intriguing. So you did you did keyholes, but uh, just keyholes, not imagining what was behind them or. I just did the well. The keyhole and it may have had some color in it. It was a really long time ago, so I don't quite remember. Or I I actually still have one of them hanging somewhere in the house. I'll go look at it and see what. Yeah, send us a photo of it. Uh, okay. Maybe more if Jay hasn't thrown them out without you knowing about it. <laughs> well, he, he now has taken to just going around and leveling all the pictures. And he went out and bought some of that tacky stuff that you put on the, you know, that doesn't leave a mark on the wall so he can have them all level. Uh huh. Okay. So, so if you need your pictures leveled, call Jay. Right. <laughs> um, it would be nice to, it would be nice to think about the keyhole and what is the keyhole allows us to do, uh, what kind of view it gives us. Uh, but look at this intimacy. I am the door of his dwelling. Isn't that, yeah, Adina. Mm -hmm. well, what, what intrigues me is the connection to the other poem too, <clears throat> that God needs the human being in order to see the world. That's God true. needs to peek through the pain that we all have and then see, and God needs the window and the door that opens uh, and and the game and the and the back and forth between the human being and 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 God self. Uh, God doesn't see without having a human being to wish to relate to and through which to see the pain and through the through the pain to see the world. So it's it's always an a, a, a relational it's a relational God. So is that P A N E or P A I N? Both, right? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I wasn't thinking. Of, I was thinking of of the yeah, nice, nice. But 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 both are represented in these poems. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Stacy. Yeah, I, I was thinking about um, something in our secular world that we become we've become very familiar with and it's the arrow through the heart to your love like for valentine's day you see the arrow piercing through the heart and it, does that create a wound does that create an opening into the heart does that 
it, does that create for the love, um, it, you know, to love to become part of the uh, uh, become part of it? And is the the meaning of uh, in in a mindful way is the meaning of what we we refer to as God? Is that what the absolute love is? And how does this you know this wound? It doesn't say it it, it wound, a wound heals and uh and you and so you can you can experience all of that love you, you can continue to experience all of that love and that knowing and that understanding and also it's passing over the threshold you know the door the keyhole is at the threshold and the door opens so that you pass through the threshold of understanding yes Yes. Richard Cody had a question. Yeah, yeah Richard. So he's also the beautiful uh, homonym here of the peak. I mean, the, the spelling of P-E-A-K, not P-E-E-K. So P -E uh, yes. Peaking it should be P-E-E-K. It should be P-E-E-K, but that's uh, it a it was a lovely and mistake. The the state, well, or not. Uh, the fears are ascending. It is so peaking. is it known, yeah. but also as he goes to the wound, he also is peaking, ascending into the world. Yeah, so if I were to remake the poem, I would spell it like I spelled it here. But what I've done, uh, <laughs> what Amichai had, had in mind, but uh, you've, made a, you've made a pearl out of it anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is um, one story that I'll tell you, and it'll take uh, 120 seconds, and then we'll be finished, that... Uh, that uh, Rabbi Natan, uh, or uh, Rabbi Barshila, Shela rather, uh, met Elijah on the, on the road and said, what's Elijah doing? What does Elijah do all day? Um, what do you do all day? And uh, Elijah said, what does God do all day? And Elijah said, well, God learns the Torah of all the rabbis. He just sits and learns Gemara. He sits and learns Talmud all the time. God's always reading, always learning Talmud, listening, not reading, but listening to, rehearsing, reciting what the rabbis had to say. Uh, and then Elijah says, except, except, for, uh, except for Rabbi Mayer. <laughs> and so, so uh, Rabbi Barshela said, why not Rabbi Mayer? Well, because he was a student of Elisha Ben Abuya, who was an apostate <laughs> and uh, a traitor and... So not Alicia Benabuya, and Rava Barshela said, you know, Rabbi Mayer is really, really smart. He's the greatest sage of his day, and he's quite capable of discerning. He can eat the meat of the pomegranate and throw away the rind. You know, he can take the best teachings of his teacher and throw away everything else. And that's the end of the meeting. But apparently the two met again, at which point Elijah, with the perfect memory, said, now whenever God learns, he begins by saying, my son Mayer says, da, da, and he quotes Rabbi, Rabbi Mayer. So we have in the story a God who learns. Um, and also I would say the reason I tell you the story is not so much for the ending, the whole ending I didn't give you, but enough of it for you to get the point. But we have a God who, who needs to learn because but one thing that God lacks is experience, you see. Ex peri, ex peril out of danger, learning something from danger, learning something from a dangerous encounter. God doesn't have dangerous encounters. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing for God to learn in that sense. How does God learn? Uh, according to that story and to the end of this poem, God learns through a kind of uh, empathy with the project of being humanity, uh, of being human. I am the door of his dwelling. I if I don't have this experience, if I don't share it, if I don't do anything with it, if I don't cry over it, if I don't open myself up to it, then God's not going to know anything about it because God does not implicitly understand such things. God is not frightened by such things uh, or grossed out by such things. So another reason, perhaps one that follows through on its own theme of why it is that we would go to Shoal anyway. Do we go to Shoal because God knows something that we need to know? Or do you know something that God needs to know or that the community uh, needs to know? But more about that another time. I think for now we are, uh, we're more than, more than done. Uh, and I appreciate your patience for hanging on. And I promise next time we won't go 10 minutes or so after all. We did start a little bit late. So uh, 10 minutes afterwards.
add. Ten minutes after is not good. But we're going to go for now. Thank you, everybody. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. And those, you. those 10 minutes really cut into a heavy social schedule. Yes. <laughs> I know, I know. You're a half a martini behind now. 